Hi everyone. I've been uh, vegan for about 10 years, but one thing I can say, when you eat raw vegan like tonight, I don't always eat raw vegan, you realize you've been constipated your whole life and you didn't know it. How many people are vegans in this group, in this room right now? Raise your hand. How many pre-vegans? How many people never raise their hands no matter what? Raise your hand. Okay. There's always a few in the group. Welcome to my presentation on Have Laptop, Will Travel. It's been said that writing a book is the hardest thing, is the hardest thing to do, the closest that any man will ever come to childbirth. Say that writing a book is the closest thing that any man will come to childbirth. Having no idea what that's like, having no idea what childbirth birth is like, I have to believe that uh, there's some truth to that, but it's, it was worth it because my book has become, in the spring, it became an international bestseller, number one in seven countries. And in this month, number one in sales in the travel business category on Amazon has been in the top 100. My book is available in paperback, which we have here tonight. Also Kindle, also the Apple platform, and also audiobooks, audiobooks in my own voice. Now, my presentation tonight is about 30 minutes. The audiobook version of my, of my manuscript is about nine hours. So I'm not going to read you the book. I'm not, as a vegan, I'm not going to read you my nine hours like on the, audio, on the audiobooks. As a vegan, I do not want to cause unnecessary harm to sentient beings. So I'm not going to read you the nine hours. I'm just going to give you this presentation. Have laptop, will travel. Memoirs of a Digital Nomad, 12 Cities in 12 Months. We're going to talk about what it means to be a digital nomad. But first, people have asked me, what is this book about? I tell them it's a travel book, that travel is the only thing you buy that makes you richer. Then they say, why did you write this book? And I tell them, because I'm in love with cities I've never been to, and I'm in love with people that I haven't even met yet. A little bit about the book. Almost two years ago now, I joined a program. I joined a 12-month program where I became a digital nomad with an organization called Remote Year. Has anyone heard of Remote Year? It's an, uh, it's an association that, that puts together teams of people. And we're all location-independent professionals, meaning we have our own businesses that we can operate remotely wherever we are in the world. Or we work for a company like companies like Unilever and Microsoft, where they actually let their employees travel around the world. So I joined this program, and that on, uh, there were 48 other people. We were a team of 49 people traveling the world. We had life-changing experiences. I was able to run my real estate family office from my smartphone and laptop, and also with uh, express mail back and forth between my office and whichever location that I was at the time. And in these 12 cities in, ten, in, in 12 months, these 10 countries on four continents, month by month, city by city, I feel, and I think you get a sense for it when you read the book, that I traveled the world, I lived in these places as a resident, not as a tourist. And last but not least, woven throughout the book, and there's a little bit of a warning on the back of the book, it says, I use my passion for veganism to, to spread my passion for veganism around the globe. So I used this remote year platform in many cities where I was. I gave presentation. We'll talk a little bit about the, 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 uh, the, the events that I spoke at. Come on, babe. There we go. A little bit about travel, and we're going to break down some of the cities, talk about cities. We won't go through all the cities, but let's talk about travel. Did you know that they've done research, Pew Research, for example, and they found that travel, for folks like us, is the number one aspiration for people, meaning what they want to do, what they'd love to do if they had their way, is to hang up all of their obligations, put all their obligations on the shelf, somehow wish them all away, things that keep them anchored to their homes where they live and work and raise family, and just get on, get on the sailboat, or get on, get on that steel bird and fly away somewhere and, may, and go away for a very long time. The thing is, 
Up until very recently, travel was reserved for just the very wealthy. It says here the most important graph in the world. Well, that might be a bridge too far, but I think it's really important to recognize we're living in the age of abundance. For the first 2,000 years, you can see it right there, almost 2,000 years, the income of mankind, the average person was zero or close to zero. Did you know that? And so if you really want to live in a world with income inequality, excuse me, income equality, what you want is poverty, war, early death, and absolute nothingness, because that's what it was until about 250 years ago when we first started having what, what gets a bad name these days, but it's literally eliminating poverty before our eyes around the world. And that's free market capitalism. Because in the last 250 years, wealth has been created and so the average person can travel. Did you know that up until 1970, only 15% of Americans had ever even been on an airplane? And now we're all getting on airplanes for, for this and for that. Travel was reserved for the aristocrats of Europe. A, a, British, uh, a British aristocrat would take, as he was a man of leisure, not like the rest of the unwashed masses, and he would take his his trip to Prague and his trip to, um, trip to Paris, and that was reserved for men of leisure. My story, my book actually starts out on the balcony of my waterfront apartment here in West Palm Beach. And that's a picture of my view. And there is the moon shining off the water, creating a road-like reflection. And little did I know there's a Swedish word for it, and it's called Mangata. And for years I've enjoyed this view on my par apartment not too far from here in West Palm Beach. And it was a little bit of foreshadowing because a few years later, I joined Remote Year and our merry band of 49 people, 49 tra intrepid travelers, our name, our team name was Mangata. It's interesting traveling with 48 people you don't know on day one for a whole year. I got to tell you. And so we called ourselves the traveling family and we, we contracted that phrase to just call it the Tramley. That's the Tramley of Mangata. Uh, that's actually at the Lenin Wall in Prague. So where, pray tell, did they take us on remote year? Just about everywhere. We started in split Croatia. We went to the Czech Republic, to Prague. We went to Lisbon, Portugal. Then we went to Asia, to Kyoto, Japan, Chiang Mai, Thailand. Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, then South America and North America, Buenos Aires, Cordoba, Argentina, Lima, Peru, Medellin, Bogota, Colombia, and finally we adjourned in Mexico City, Mexico. So let's break down a few of the places that I went. Split Croatia was the first country we went to, and it was a good, excuse me, uh, the first city, and it was a good place to go because you can see there's our office, it was there on the beach, our, my apartment was right there as well. Part of remote year is we had an office to go to. We, they gave us apartments. Of course, we paid for this every month. And so over here at the top right, you can see that is a castle. That's Diocletian's castle. And Croatia was part of the Roman Empire. It had a long history. It recently came out of communism. But Diocletian's castle was part of the deeper meaning that I try to explain in the book. I, I like to tell people that Rather than just being a book about a guy doing a bunch of cool stuff, look at me, look at me, look at me. Actually, I try to avoid that at all costs. Maybe some of that still got through, I'm not sure. But I looked for the deeper meaning of things. And in many cases, and to a large extent, I think the deeper meaning found me. And so this Diocletian's castle, which was once used for torturing Christians and killing Christians and taking all the money from the people without any representation, and the people didn't even have any money, the king just built this beautiful, or the emperor built this beautiful place. Diocletian's castle is now a rest, is filled with restaurants, bars, nightclubs, souvenir shops, hotels. And so I'm sitting there thinking, wow, that's, it, uh, that represents to me a huge change in the human condition, that it's better, that it's better for us now than it was, say, back in Diocletian's age, and certainly getting better and more optimistic since communism fell. In our second month, we were in Prague, Czech Republic. It's a post-communist country on the way up. And it says there, spellbinding architecture. 
It absolutely is spellbinding architecture. One thing that I turned out, thought turned out really nice in my book is that each chapter, each chapter is broke is the city that we lived in for a month, right? And each chapter starts off with, if I can find, a, a map of where we are in the world, the city we lived in, and then there's also a quote. A quote that could, came from someone else that tries to set the tone for that chapter in that city that we lived in. And Prague's opening inspirational quote that sets the tone for the chapter, in Prague the quote says, some people prefer electronic books because they think paper books take up space. But then your children take up space. The Sistine Chapel, it takes up space. And the city of Prague, it takes up space too. Absolutely beautiful, old world, otherworldly, old world Europe style, if you can understand what I'm saying. It's, it's one of the, oh, actually one of the only cities that did not get, get bombed in World War II. And then before that, it's one of the only European cities that didn't get completely rebuilt in the 18, 1900s. Because it's so beautiful when you go to this place and you see this uh, medieval, old world European charm. It just takes your breath away. And so we were there in the anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. The Velvet Revolution is called that because communism was overthrown really without any violence or out without the shedding of blood. And so we went on a field trip, remote year, in every city we were in, organized these uh, field trips. But they were kind of field trips that no, that, that no tourists would know about. So there we were with a historian, his name is Marcus, and he walked us on the anniversary of the Velvet Revolution, he walked us through the big square where they had a huge demonstration. And as the story goes, the demonstration was organized by students. And it was on a Friday. And so the students wanted to go have their demonstration in the square opposing the current system and opposing communism. But they were going home for the weekend, so they took their laundry. They took their laundry and the, they got trapped with the police. There was a melee and the police beat them with billy clubs and people went all over the place and the laundry got, got scattered everywhere. And it looked, actually looked like a massacre had occurred, but it didn't. But the pictures were taken, the, 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 the pictures went all over the news around the world. And so the communists actually stepped down just because of that. So you could say in a very real sense, and I write about this, you could say in a real sense that dirty laundry defeated communism in what is now the Czech Republic. And so then we went, in month three, went to Lisbon, Portugal. And I could talk so much about Portugal. I actually went there this summer for two weeks just for a holiday because I loved it so much when I lived here for a month. There's a special light about Lisbon. It's, if you've ever been to San Diego, you know what I'm talking about with a, that special sunlight. But Lisbon actually has even, I think, even a special light. We called it the Lisbon light. But just outside of Lisbon is a place called Fatima. And it's a miracle, a very holy place for the Catholic Church. The Virgin Mary is said to appear there three times to some children and made some predictions about the end of World War I and so on. And so it's a very holy place for the Catholics. And this is what I saw. You can see them walking on their knees. See that? To the shrine where they have the altar, the holy spot where the Virgin Mary appeared. And so this is where a little bit of my veganism is going to come into play. What we call maybe deep veganism where, you know, the food is great, but when, you get, when you've been doing this long enough, you realize it's not just about, it's not just about me and my body. It's about the world we want to live in. It's about some spirituality aspects. It's about not making a war on the environment. And to me, and so actually that was one of my things, one of my uh, themes that I was able to develop when I traveled. My basic presentation. I used to use all PowerPoint when I was traveling through Asia and I needed interpreters that PowerPoint's not going to do any good because it's in English, right? So I learned how to speak this way without a PowerPoint presentation. And so what I developed is the five aspects of health, which is our physical health, our mental health, our spiritual health, our societal health, and then our environmental health. And all these things are supported when we eat plant-based diet, when we eat animal, animal-based diet, when we eat animal protein. It's a war on nature. It's a war on society. It's literally 
animal agriculture created the institution of war. That's the topic for, that's the, uh, we'll go into that deeper for another, another presentation, but it seemed to me with our mental health, when we eat animal products, we're disconnected from the reality. And so we're so disconnected that we, we ask our higher power for things we're not willing to give. And that's what struck me, not as a criticism, just as a, a, yawn, a yearning for humanity to hopefully collectively and individually wake up and realize that how can we ask for something? How can we ask for health? How can we ask for peace? How can we ask for mercy when there's mercilessness on our plate? So the idea is that our values that we hold mainstream, liberation, freedom, justice, equality, kindness, respect, compassion, respect for females, all of these things that we, that we hold as mainstream ideals for humanity, it's very important that those ideals are also reflected on the plate. Does that make sense? Is that good? All right, let me hear it. <laughs> Thank you. We went to Asia for three months. I'm going to preempt a question. I'd be happy to take some questions afterwards. afterwards. And every time I present about this book, people, I get the same question, so I'm gonna preempt it now. People ask me, which was my favorite country that I lived in? You might have already thought of it. So I'm gonna say it's Japan, because I finally found a country and a culture and a city for that matter, where things were done on time, perfectly, without any drama, without raising our voice, where things are clean, everything was almost seemingly perfect. See the bikes in the picture. Walking to my, from my apartment to the workspace, about a 15 minute walk, uh, first actually to Bikram Yoga, then to the workspace. I love routines, so I always found a yoga place. Always, it was always on the way to the workspace. It's just these serendipity things. You pass these bikes in other apartment buildings. They never ever lock the bike. No one ever locks a bike in Japan, open there for anybody to take it, because no one's ever stolen a bike in Japan. It would never, it's not how they would even think. It's, it's just, it's the culture. And then you see the change in the middle of the plate there, the bottom. If you go to a restaurant and you leave some change in, in the, in the, in the uh, what do you call that thing? <laughs> in the bowl. Leave some change in the bowl. I, I left three yen, which is each yen is about a tenth of a penny. And they, two times in different places, they ran, they chased me out of the restaurant, down the street to give me back my three tenths of a cent. Because in principle, that would be basically taking advantage of somebody, even if it's just one third or three tenths of a cent, that would be a violation of their principles. And that's Japan. Then we went to Chiang Mai, Thailand, and you can see there I'm in this store I call the Buddha store. On one side were religious, religious uh, items, like uh, calendars and statues and DVDs and so on. And the other side was the food which was assumed vegan. And this is the second country now. When I went to Japan, I could go to any restaurant and I can ask for the vegan option. And it would be it would assumed to be vegan and it was delicious. And of course there were root vegetables and things that I'd never even saw or heard of before. And that was part of the, really part of the fun. We'll talk about it a little bit. Part of the fun of traveling is, is eating this vegan cuisine all over the world, which is so well represented. I thought to myself, gosh, this Buddhism thing, they're, even though they may not follow it, but Buddhism really does adhere to the original tenets of compassion and nonviolence to all beings. That really resonated with me. It's a law and order monarchy. They dissolved their parliament a few years back. They've had a king system for a very long time that's backed by the military. You cannot speak your mind, you will go to jail. You cannot say badly about the king, even on hearsay, your neighbor tattles on you, the police will show up, probably take you to jail. You cannot take their money and crumple it up and throw it on the floor because that dude's picture is on the money. You go to jail. 
I was pulled over in Bangkok. I was frisked. I was asked to get out of the tuk-tuk. I was frisked. They went through my wallet like with a fine tooth comb, definitely looking for, you know, obviously for contraband or something. Um, so that's, but you know what? It works for them. And actually one of the takeaways that actually happened here when I saw all this orderliness was why do you need a messy democracy where everybody's fighting over everything when you've got 2,000 years of culture telling them what to do and how to, how to act and that to me. And so why not just have an administrative monarchy where you, know, you, don't, have a, you don't have representative democracy? Why would you want that when everything is just the way it is? That's, that was a, a real paradigm shift for me. Not that I'll always, I'll always love our system of government and think it's the best, but it definitely opened my eyes to some of that. I gave presentations in Europe, I mean, excuse me, in Asia, in Japan, and Thailand. And this one, actually, my presentation was in the Wildflower Home, a shelter for, for single mothers. And actually, 10% of the proceeds of this book have gone and will go to this shelter called the Wildflower Home outside of Chiang Mai, Thailand. And so actually yeah, Remote Year has charity uh, organizations that they tap, tap into so that we get into, we get into a city we have a track to run on. So we went to this place and I was actually doing some manual labor for the, the second day, if you can believe it, I was shoveling gravel into a wheelbarrow and taking it to the other side of the property because they're doing a project and it was lunchtime and I noticed that the young mothers, they're cooking the mung beans. And so I went to the head, I went to the head nun, because it's run by the Catholic Church. And before I finished, I said, can I, I'm a health educator from Hippocrates, and can I hold a sprout, or, yes, like I didn't finish the sentence, can I have a sprout, hold a sprout workshop for the young mothers? So I went into Old Town, I found some sprouting equipment, I found a lady selling some mung bean sprouts and some almonds, or seeds that we could sprout. And I held a, you can see in the middle lower slide, I had a little workshop with the mothers and I didn't say much. I had a translator. I just kept saying low cost, high nutrition for the children, low cost, high nutrition for the children. And then I paused a little bit and I said, low cost, high nutrition for the children. And I think that resonated. I think that, I think the organizers and the head nun that actually resonated with them because, you know, these nonprofits are always trying to save money, right? And I was long gone. Weeks had gone by. We leave Thailand. We're now in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, which we'll talk about next. And I get an instant message from one of the organizers at Wildflower, Tyler Rose, and she's sending me a picture of the weeks later of the young mothers making a huge bowl of sprouts and they had some greens there. And like I said in the instant message, I'm so happy about this, you have no idea. Actually, looking back, you know, having a career in real estate and all the things I know I've done in that space, but looking back, it's going to sound really corny, but this actually has to be one of the greatest accomplishments of my life. Just feeling that. Thank you. But you ain't seen nothing yet. Listen on. It gets better. Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia a megatropolis. You see that building, the Petronas Twin Towers. They're, those buildings are like that are, there's so many different buildings that are huge, giant skyscrapers. In just a few decades, they went from 1 million to 10 million people. It's a 70% Muslim country. And I have to admit, I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about that. Having uh, studied Islam ever since 9-11, I have a whole shelf in my library, uh, a whole section actually, on the autobiography of Muhammad, and the history of Islam. Um, and I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, but I was received very nicely. Um, people talk about the developing countries being corrupt, the third world being corrupt. That's nothing new. In Malaysia, every, almost every real estate project, as I understand it, was based on graft, based on paying people off, based on corruption. You have to pay to play. These two uh, young, young people, Dave and Rima are vegan activists. They're actually also in law school. And they took me to their neighborhood. It's that middle slide, Little Italy. We went to a restaurant. First time I've ever been to a restaurant called a donation restaurant, where you pay, you pay whatever you think 
is the right amount. So he said, Dave said, I usually pay four ringgit, which is about $1.25. So I figured, all right, $1.25, that's, that's uh, actually a really good deal. I'm gonna, and it was buffet too. Can you believe it? Buffet. And all of a sudden we're sitting down and his, I thought his mouth dropped open. I thought maybe a cockroach got into his curry. He says, don't look now, but there's a man coming our way. Just smile. The man comes over, 80, 80s, in the 80s, dressed to the nines with his bizarre comb over, very dark skin, very, very Indian, very tall. And he said, how do I know you, young man? And Dave said, I don't, I don't know you, sir. And it just went back and forth. The man finally gave up. He went back. He's in the book. He's called Mr. X. He's so dangerous that the editors, once they checked on some things, re recommended that they, we take out his real name and we put him in there as Mr. X. So then I was informed when he was on the other side of the restaurant, Dave told me that he was involved in a $100 million corruption scheme on, to build a hospital for the Indians. And whoop, build a hospital for the Indians. And he was accused. He got caught absconding with millions and millions of dollars. He fled the country. He bought his immunity and he came back. There was a trial. Before that, there was a trial. And the witnesses in the trial of, to try to put Mr. X in jail for corruption kept disappearing. They all kept getting killed. So this guy had a lot of blood on his hands. So then Dave tells me, my sister is a lawyer, which I knew. And she was one of the lead attorneys in, in the corruption scandal. And that man recognized me in the courtroom because I'd spent many weeks in the courtroom supporting my sister. And so one of the, the greatest things about, and I hope you, if you read the book or you listen to it on audio, if you get the sense that there's nothing like the doing, there's nothing, you know, an ounce of experience is worth more than a ton of theories. And that was, what's, that was one of the, this some of the driving stories that actually compelled me to want to write a book because I felt like it was just so real and it was something that I didn't read in a book or something I didn't see on the news or in TV. It was actually really personal experiencing it firsthand. In this month in Kuala Lumpur, I gave five lectures. They, they actually or, they organized five events for me. One of them was they flew me to Kuala Lumpur, excuse me, Kathmandu, Nepal, from Kuala Lumpur, where I was the keynote speaker at the Asian Pacific Vegetarian Congress. And I did my thing. I, by then I had my five principles of health, our physical health, our mental health, our, our spiritual health, our societal health, our environmental health. I did that like I could do it if I needed to do it, you know, tomorrow or tonight. But we won't do that tonight. And then there was the farewell, farewell party in Kathmandu. Everyone, the organizers and some of the guests and some of the other presenters, and there's music. And they're also singing. They're on the table. They're giving speeches. They're eating like they're going to the electric chair tomorrow. And all of it was done without alcohol. And in, in Nepal, they really don't drink too much. In Malaysia, they really don't drink too much. And so that was an interesting, that was actually a breakthrough. I actually write about it in the book. People, people are always surprised. They're like, oh, you're a vegan and you drink wine? I say, well, I'm a vegan, not a saint. So uh, it was th that month I actually decided to go dry, not drink wine because we're in a Muslim country. I wanted to try to see what it was, <laughs> try to see what it's like. But, you know, that, this, this, all this socializing and partying was done without alcohol. And to me, that was a very interesting. Uh, it was a breakthrough for me. So I had a great weekend in Kathmandu. I'm on the airplane. We're on the runway. We're turning the corner to face the other way to hit the jets. And nothing prepared me for what happened next. I heard a big explosion. I thought that our engine had exploded. Then it didn't seem that that happened. And then the, the stewardess points out the window and says, there's been a crash. I went to the window, I unbuckled my belt, I went and I saw huge plumes of, it wasn't fire like you've seen, it, it was more like just the hell of, the hell that's created with jet fuel and twisted steel. And this picture was taken like an hour later, I was so weirded out, I didn't even think about, you know, 
I wasn't going to take pictures like that. And so as it turned out, and by the way, this, I could talk an hour about this one. There's so many insights, like the way the government handled information about this crash. Well, I'll just, I'll say, I'll just a little bit of a, uh, <clears throat> of a departure. They, the air traffic control is talking, giving information about the crash to the captain. And then the captain's giving it to me. Like, it's so loosey-goosey, right? Like, then they open the cockpit, uh, not the cockpit, the, uh, the main door. And we're, I'm like looking right at the crash. And I can see stretchers with remains. And so quickly it became a, became from a rescue operation to a recovery operation. And it really shook me. And I remember thinking, and the takeaway, even as I stand here today, the takeaway is that we want to be worthy of a life well lived. We want to be worthy of a life well lived. 38 people died. 10 people they never even found. They were just incinerated. So I called my mom. But when, when something like that happens, if you're lucky enough to still have a mom in your life, first thing I thought of is I got to call my mom, right? So I have a half... I have maybe uh, half a bar to a bar, cell phone, very bad reception. I told my mom, my dad's on the speakerphone too. They're, they freak out. They're like, you need to stop this remote you're traveling. You need to get your cell phone right now. You need to stop this. You've, you've done enough. Da, 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 da. I called my sister. You need to stop this remote you're program. You need to get your cell phone. This has gone too far. What are you trying to do? So it, it ended up being that I was the one consoling them instead of the other way around. Three months in Europe, six, three months in Asia, six months in South America and North America. And we started out in two months in Argentina, Buenos Aires and Cordoba. So all of the honor, respect, punctuality, manners, cleanliness that I had come to really love in Asia was completely Completely, and I'm not, I'm not going to knock the Argentinians because you'll see how I hopefully uh, dig myself out of the hole. But it was all thrown out the window. And so Uber didn't work. And so the cab driver, a cab driver, told me, he said, yeah, we're, us Argentinians, he volunteered it. Us Argentinians, we're, we're Spanish descent and we're Italian descent. And we got all of the bad and none of the good from them. And he says, as a matter of fact, he said, do you know, I guess it's raining hard, right? Nice. The hurricane's coming early, maybe. The cab driver continued. He said, do you know how an Argentinian man kills himself, kills, commits suicide? I said, no, how? He says he climbs up to the top of his ego and he jumps off. Argentina is besieged as we, as we, Gather here tonight, Argentina is besieged with existential, structural, economic problems. Essentially, and I researched this, set up by General Perón, who was head of Secretary of Labor at the time in the 40s, and he brought, he brought in all of these regulations and labor rules, and then the public sector spending that's continued, which is close to 50% right now, crowds out capital formation, and these people are in basically an economic death spiral. Just in the two months that we were there, people, they had inflation of 24%. So on the way from the apartment to the workspace, you could see from one day to the next, the price of apples had changed. Imagine if you're in your job, two months later, your paycheck's worth only 75% of what it was before. And so you see the flames there, you see that bonfire. That was the result, that was the work of a, about a thousand electrical union workers that buffaloed past me after lunch one day, buffaloed past me, went to the intersection that was close to me and lit that bonfire and then went about two blocks further down to the electrical station headquarters. Outside of the city, we went to an impoverished neighborhood. And in this, in this uh, uh, nonprofit effort, we built solar panels made from Coke bottles that acted as water heaters for houses, for a house. And we were successful in it. 
We were successful in it. Do you know how to make a hot water heater from Coke bottles? I'm going to tell you right now. You take, you take a empty beer can, you squash it flat, you paint it black, you stick it on a popsicle stick type piece of wood, and then you take that flattened Coke can painted black, you stick it inside a one liter Coke bottle that's cut in half, and then you take those, you take the one liter Coke bottle with the beer can inside and you stick all of that inside a two liter Coke bottle cut in half, and then you string them together with PVC pipe and you make, you string them together and you make the cell. And so we put it on top of the roof. It took a weekend. And I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I grew up with Amish people. I know Amish people. And so if you know anything about the, the Amish, they can build you a barn in three days. And they raise that wall with the ropes and it's, so it was like for me, it resembled like an Amish barn raising. We raised the water heater. We put the water in the one end it coursed through, it coursed through, and water shot out the other side. This was no experimental model. This was a tried and true workhorse uh, that's won all kinds of uh, award in the nonprofit charity space. The kissing culture of Argentina. They totally won me over. The thing I noticed right away in Argentina is whether you're in a grocery store or at the mall or you're in an office or any kind of setting anywhere, you're at the tailor, when the people get to work, the grocery store, when the people get to work, the first thing they do is they spend at least a half an hour, maybe more, walking around and kissing everybody. Walking around and kissing their colleagues. I mean, they're just so happy. I just, I just couldn't believe it. They're kissing. I'm thinking to myself, and this went on for weeks and weeks the entire time I was there. I was thinking to myself, gosh, if this were the United States, by, by lunchtime, there would be like 50 sexual harassment lawsuits and the whole thing would just be, just the whole thing would just fail really badly. In this month, one of the months, Cordoba, Argentina, I broke my foot. And I was really, really down. I was really, really down. I went to therapy. And the therapist, when he met me, he kissed me. When I left, <laughs> he kissed me on the cheek. Only on one side. They kissed on one side. The doctor kissed me. What? Oh, this one. Yeah, that my left, your right, right? So in a way, you could say the Argentinian people, for all of their problems, that was the takeaway for me, for, their, for their, their, this, this atmosphere of economic tension, they literally kissed their way into my heart and taught me a lot about happiness. Taught me a lot about happiness. Lima, Peru. It's a mix, it says they are a mix of European and Western Hemisphere Indians. But you see this lady, when you get just outside the city of Lima, they're all about this tall. And that's maybe, I mean, can't be more than four and a half feet. And they're in pigtails, the ladies are in pigtails, and they wear these bright color alpaca, alpaca wool outfits. Lima is a first world, first class city has some of the best restaurants in the world, has, I think, the most Michelin-rated restaurants in all of South America. But just outside of the town called Cusco, which is an hour plane ride from Lima, I participated in a sacred ayahuasca ceremony. Participated, participated, and that's where that hut, the hut in the middle, is where we, 10 of us, laid down on comfortable yoga mat and pillows and drank a medicine. And we hallucinated for five hours. And I can tell you that it wasn't fun. It wasn't like a recreational high. It was actual. And I, I, I write about it extensively. And I'm so glad I wrote some detailed notes the following day when I had the, when I had the, uh, the experience. Literally communicated with the divine. And it's one thing to go to church and sing about God and talk about God and know all about God. But until you've experienced and you maybe really see that there's, there's other dimensions out there that one thing I came away with that our spirit will be able to travel great distances in a short period of time. There's so many other, I can't, I'm, not, I'm usually not a guy that talks this way, but there's other worlds, there's other dimensions and we can go there really fast when we're free from this, from this cage that is our, is our, is our body. Finally, 
we adjourned in, the, in Mexico City. Before that, we were in Colombia for two months. You can ask me about Colombia or you can read about it in chapters 10 and 11. CDMX. Anybody know what that, that stands for? Can you say it in Spanish? Ciudad de Mexico, city of Mexico, CDMX. And there's our group. We started out 49 on day one, and we ended with about 30 people. And it's interesting, people leave because life gets in the way. People lose their jobs, people miss their girlfriend or boyfriend, people realize this travel thing wasn't for me. When you get to chapters eight and nine, you realize that in my book, you realize I am I'm blown. I'm just spent. I am just tired of traveling. I want to get home, but I made a deal with myself. Some people just quit. And there's actually a group of us that were like the, you know, I guess a little bit of self-righteous people that proclaim we're not quitters and we never quit. So that was one of the driving forces for me to just hang in there for 12 months. Did you know that this city of 20 million people is built on a lake and that that because it grew to 20 million people, they had to make space, they had to make land. So they filled in clay on this land. And therefore, the buildings are all messed up. One building's this way, one building's leaning that way. And on top of that, or actually underneath it, but figuratively speaking, on top of all that, right, the city is on these tectonic plates that are constantly at odds with each other. And so uh, Ciudad de Mexico gets 20 earthquakes a day, counting tremors. I don't list it here, but maybe I should write it out. The signature feature of the, of the Mexican people I learned is to please you. The signature feature of the Mexican culture is to please you. And I asked somebody, we actually, my brother-in-law's family lives there, I asked them, I feel like the signature feature of the Mexican people is to please you. He said, you know what he said? Without even hesitating, he said, thank you. That is actually something that we pride ourselves on. And I thought that was really great. Vegan food around the world. Well, you guys know Andy Ronan. He's a colleague here, Dr. Andy. So he has said that three people, and we're going to wrap it up, and I'll be happy to take some questions um, and also uh, sign books for you. Andy, who works here, he's a, a psychotherapist, said he's only met three people that can actually do the Hippocrates diet perfectly day in, day out. Think about that. Everything that is, the fasting on Wednesdays, completely raw, sprouts, no processed food, you know, juicing in the morning and the afternoon, the wheatgrass, the stuff. I mean, he's only met three people. I think I have an idea who those three people are. So the answer is, where I'm going with this, is I didn't exactly eat the Hippocrates diet when I was traveling. You know what I used? You guys heard of Happy Cow? It's an app for vegans, right? And wherever you are in the world, you punch it up, and it brings up the vegan restaurants or, or, op or restaurants with vegan options. You can write reviews. It's like Yelp for vegans. So one thing I learned is there's vegan food. I don't care where you are in this world, there's always vegan food all around. And so I thought that was wonderful because you worry when you travel, you know, are there going to be vegan options for me? So what does this all mean? I learned that cultures are diverse despite globalism. There seems to be a lack of upward mobility. The idea that always an Uber driver, once an Uber, once, always, once an Uber driver, always an Uber driver. I noticed that around the world. Understand, in the United States, we have something called income mobility. Did you know that 50% of the people will be in the top 10% of income for at least two years in their lifetime? People go up and down the income scale. You have to understand, around the world, when you're born into something, that's pretty much where you're going to stay. We have something called income mobility. We also have buying power. When you consider that televisions today cost about six cents on the dollar, from the crappy televisions, well, by comparison, crappy, the televisions from 1970, we have buying power. That we spend about 80% less on food than the farmers did 100 years ago. We have buying power. The idea that electricity, 
Today, today's electricity would cost about a half a million dollars a month. That's a very extreme example. Um, video phones. To buy a video phone in the 80s was about a half a million bucks. Now it's free on the smartphone. Harvard quality education, free on the smartphone. I mean, we are living in the age of abundance. And I, and I think I really, I really tried to bring that out in the book. Everywhere I went, I wanted to point to the betterment of the human condition. Everywhere I go, people are nice. I learned that this book has chapters. It has an ending, but the story really never ends, right? It's about the proverbial journey, not the destination. It wasn't all fun and games. As I said, I was really tired by months seven or eight and nine. I wanted to leave the program. There was broken bones. There was broken cell phones. There were broken hearts. There were a lot of ups and downs. It will probably take me an entire lifetime to process everything that happened to me. Things that you read in the book are still processed. In the, in the scope of this book, I actually gave 16 lectures in eight countries. But in 12 months, there was a 13th month I traveled that we, did, we didn't have in this book. I traveled on a vegan speaking tour. So all told, within a year's time, I gave out 40 lectures in 16 countries. And the point I want to make is, I learned after talking to all these people and speaking here in Hippocrates and help working with the health educators, I learned that the only person we can change is who? Is us. The world's oldest person. There she is. She's got birthday cake, candles for 117. She's been around a while. She's from, she lives in Italy. They asked her, what's it like to be 117? She said, oh, it goes by really fast. That's what it's like. My point is, like I said, I didn't want to be the guy that's writing a book, doing all this cool, cool stuff. Look at me, look at me, look at me. My point is, this lady, she lives to 120, which is our genetic potential. Or I was just actually came straight from here from a funeral. He was 66 years old. Died very suddenly. Very close family friend. And so whether we're living to 66 or 120, any way you look at it, we're only here for a few decades, right? It's short one way or the other. So while we're here, my hope and my aspiration for all of you is that your Mangata, your road-like path reflection, is extraordinary, adventurous, and purposeful. And that's how Laptop Will Travel. Thank you. <laughs> Does, uh, any questions? And maybe we can, since we're taping, we can use the microphone for any questions. And then, uh, and then I'd be happy to sign the book. Anybody have a question? Yes. Please. There you go. Hi. Uh, hi. That was very heartfelt and heartwarming and very nice uh, to hear all about that and some pictures. Thank you. So thank you for sharing your journey. And you had mentioned, you made it seem like it was your last year of journey because you're still uh, going through your 12 month journey. Have you decided that you will not do this again oh. for another year? Thank you for your question. I adjourned last September with my group. The program was for a year. So I came back into the real world um, late last year. So is that, is that, are you wondering if I'm going to do it again? Yeah, like either on your own. Yeah, so yeah, actually I was, um, in two, I was in Europe for two months this year, uh, this summer with remote year, because now that I've been through the program, I have the ability to go into any city that they're operating just for a month at a time. They're, our designation now, our title is citizen. So a citizen can go into a remote your city for a month at a time. And so I wouldn't do a whole year again. That's, that's really because, because I can't. <laughs> because it was so, it was, uh, I wouldn't see the value. Of it. Like it was just so, it was, it really was hard. It was at first, and that's why so many people dropped out. At first it's like a vacation, like wow. Look at all, it's like a kid in a candy store. FOMO, fear of missing out. 
Well, it was something to do every night and every day. And then as things go along, guess what? FOMO turns into LOMO. Love of missing out. And so uh, thank you for your question. I'll always love travel, but I feel like I did it and there's like nothing more to do in that idea. But I'll always travel because it's the only thing we buy that makes us richer, right? <laughs> and I'm in love with cities I've never been to and people I've never met. So thank you. Yes, sir, how are you? Oh, no, just hold it down. Yeah, Okay, please. Great, thank you. Great, great question. I probably should have broken that down before because probably everybody was thinking what you're thinking. So that's a great question. So remote year is very inex uh, relatively inexpensive. What people do, most of the people traveling are millennials. So these, what are they, 30 something years old? And so what they do is they will put, get rid of their apartment and have no apartment back home, put things in storage. And so remote year charges $5,000 up front as a registration fee. And then 2000, or they raise it now, it's $2,300 a month includes the apartment, the workspace, and the travel. You have to get yourself to the first city and get yourself away from the last city, if that makes any sense. So the whole thing's about all in about $30,000. But and so you have to understand for, that's basically what people pay in rent. And so I had, you know, I have my home here. I've got my roots here. My place sat here like a museum. You know, I'm a pretennial. I'm a pretend millennial. I'm a little older, so I've got some roots here that, uh, that I'm going to keep. Does that answer your question? Yeah. But, oh, then how do people make money? Well, they not make money. Uh, the food wasn't included. No, the food's not included. People, you have an apartment, so you go shopping, you go to a grocery store. Uh, that's a whole other thing I talk about in my book, uh, the way that I, you know, hacked vegan cuisine for my apartment. It was just these bio stores are everywhere, these so-called health food stores. And they were, you know, they would have meat and cheese in a little area, but by and large, they were, you know, plant-based uh, organic restaurants. So anybody, uh, thank you for your question. Anybody else? Yes. Um, okay, so just as you were wrapping up, you said that the only person you can change is yourself, and that's what you learned from your 40 lectures. Yeah. And I wonder how people across the world are receiving this message. And you know, in a lot of countries, you hear that protein consumption is on the rise because they're becoming more wealthy. And the first time they want to I know. eat more meat, which is. And I wonder, like, how the whole thing is. That's a really good question. The question, if I could summarize it, is around the world, how is the vegan message being received, but also what are the behavior patterns of these countries that you know, are, are going from developing countries to second world countries to first world countries where they ha can afford meat, dairy products, and eggs. Let's, let's understand right now, meat, dairy products, and eggs are a sign of affluence. They've really only been widely available for say, give or take 100 years. When one beautiful thing is people, communities around the world, they're lifting the veil and you've got veg fests now where you never had a veg fest. You've got this incredible awareness. You've got dedicated organizers and, and activists in, in all these places where you know, they, they put us up in their houses, they pick us up at the airport, you know, all these things. And they're like, they're the vegans of the town. And they take us to the restaurant, and they take us to these places where we have potluck. And so there's this burgeoning but fledgling thing of this vegan movement that's, that is so far light years ahead of just in the time I've been you know, being an activist in the way that I can in the last, say, three or four years. And at the same time, there are these headwinds, I'll call them, of you know, India, for example, just loving dairy. And, um, it's interesting to see. We don't know how it's going to play out because historically they will buy meat, dairy products and eggs. But now with this new awareness and, so, and, this, and, and globalism and, and social media and instant messaging and this instant instantness around the world, you know, international food is only 20, 30 years old, guys. I mean, we, the idea that we can go to a, a mall or go 
some, the idea we can go out for dinner and say, hey, do, are you in the mood for Thai? Are you in the mood for Asian? Are you in the mood for uh, American Grill? Are you in the mood for seafood? God forbid. But, you know, these different styles of cuisine. You want Indian tonight? This is, this is very, very new. My ancestors in the mountains of Greece, all the way in the north, with mountains as high as Switzerland, they ate what the hell came out of the ground. They weren't deciding, they weren't deciding Thai food or Asian food or Indian food or American growth. They ate the vegetables that came out of the ground for the, and on special occasions, they might, I would imagine, have animal products. And so that's how it was. Thank you for your question. Anybody? <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. I'm here to uh, talk more and to sign books. If you sign one and buy it, the, the front desk will, uh, will ring you up. Thank you. Oh, another question. We've got one more question. <laughs> Uh -huh. what, what do you do as a facilitator? What is that sort of? Yeah, so I, um, I went through his training and I help him, I accompany him on his trip, his, uh, some speaking tours when he invites me. Okay. Yeah. So I did. Yeah, thank you.